Good morning. Thank you for joining us here today. I'd like to uh, thank a couple of guests who are here with us. I want to recognize the Reverend Johnny Green, President and CEO of MPAC New York, Senior Pastor at Mebo Baptist Church. Reverend Renee Washington Gardner, Memorial Baptist Church. Michael Hardy from the National Action Network. <laughs> Rabbi Arthur Schneer, uh, Park East Synagogue. <laughs> Members of the Governor's Administration, Robert Mujica, New York State Budget Director. <laughs> Kareem Kamara, Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Faith Initiatives. We have Fran Barrett, New York State Interagency Coordinator for Nonprofits. <laughs> Ruth Castle Thompson, Special Advisor for Policy and Community Affairs of the New York State Homes and Community Renewal. Dr. Guillermo Linares, President of the New York State Higher Education Services Corporation. <laughs> and Julissa Gutierrez, New York State Chief Diversity Officer. And of course, of course, our special guest here today is uh, Martin Luther King III. Thank you for being here. And the cherry on top, of course, is the governor, Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> special thank you to you. During these deeply troubling and divisive times, Governor Cuomo has been a vocal champion for our New York values of diversity and tolerance. And today, he has helped us gather interfaith leaders from across New York to reflect on our values and our faith and to show the world New York's commitment to our diversity and ensuring every single New Yorker is counted in the 2020 census. I know there are other important events going on this year. But today, all of our focus, today and for the next couple of months, our focus is on the 2020 census. Now please join me in welcoming Rabbi Rachel Ain from the Sutton Place Synagogue to deliver this morning's invocation. She is joined by members of the Governor's Interfaith Council, Bishop Orlando Finlater from New Hope Christian Fellowship Church, Imam Tahir from Albanian Islamic Cultural Center, T.K. Naga Nakagaki, President of the Buddhist Council of New York, and Sikh Sindh. Oh God and God of our ancestors, we ask for your blessing as we embark on a journey to honor the dignity of difference and to celebrate our common humanity. Just last week in synagogues, we recalled the biblical commandment to each bring a half shekel, a way of being counted in the community. But it was a half shekel, not a whole, signifying that only when we join together is the community better. The census you see derives from our foundational text, the Torah. It was Moses who conducted the first census of the Israelites at your command, O oh God, recognizing that we needed to understand who made up our community. We gather here today representing many faiths and traditions. We pray in different languages and we read different scriptures. But we are here together precisely because we see the holiness of our differences and appreciate that in those differences we find you, O oh God, who create us all equally in your divine image. So guide us in our search for all the parts that make this nation whole. Teach us patience as we embark to find all who should be counted. Endow us with the ability to strive for greater wisdom and understanding. And grant us the humility to know that we don't have all the answers. 
but it is in our desire for collective unity that we create the tapestry of our great state and our great nation that can be seen. When all of the different parts are sewn together, we create an even greater whole. And so be with us, God, when we join hands to complete our civic responsibility and honor your holy commandment. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be here with you today, all of you faith leaders from across this great state of New York. It's an honor to be with Martin Luther King III, a true hero, a powerful figure in America. I'm honored to also join our great governor, Andrew Cuomo. Just to think about it, Martin Luther King III and Governor Andrew Cuomo on the same stage. That's a dynamic duo. They have honored their respective legacies. And now, and know their fathers are looking down on both of them today and smiling on them. I have watched Governor Cuomo for a long time in a number of situations. When they write the history books, it will have to record that Governor Andrew Cuomo was one of the greatest governors of the state of New York. He is rebuilding our state with new airports, roads, and bridges. He has done more to advance social justice than any other governor in modern history, raising our minimum wage to the highest in the nation, providing dignity to workers with paid family leaves, focusing more on education, especially in our poor school district, and the list goes on and on and on. But in these times of crisis, not only is he a great political leader, but our governor is a great moral leader, standing side by side with everyday New Yorker demanding the absolute best for us. I applaud Governor Cuomo's accomplishment, but even more, I respect the governor's character. It is my honor to welcome and to introduce the 56th governor of the state of New York, the Honorable Governor Andrew M. Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What a beautiful room. This is New York. Let's give uh, Bishop Findlater a big round of applause. Thank him for his leadership. Rabbi Ain, thank you very much for uh, your good words. Rabbi Schneier, all my colleagues who are here today, uh, Secretary of State Rosanna Rosado, who is leading our census efforts. Let's give her a big round of applause. And our special guest, and I'm just honored and thrilled to be with him, Martin Luther King III. Martin and I have been friends 20 years. Remember when you were young and your parents would say, I've known that person for 20 years. <laughs> You'd say like, is that even mathematically possible? Can you know someone 20 years? It's like an eternity. Man, someone's gonna die soon when they said that. I've known him for 20 years. But it has been 20 years. Uh, one of the first times we met, I was HUD secretary, I was invited by Martin uh, and the let, late Coretta Scott King, a beautiful, beautiful woman. Let's give her a round of applause. I was invited to give the Martin Luther King address on Martin Luther King Day at the Ebenezer Baptist Church. So you want to talk about pressure. This was pressure, right? Uh, I called my father, who was governor of New York at the time, and I said, you know, I was invited to this speech, and he said, oh, that is an impossible speech to give. 
That was pressure. I said, so you're going to help me on the speech, Pop? He said, no, no, no. You're on your own on this one. <laughs> I mumbled through. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Bishop Findlater for uh, remembering my father and uh, remembering Martin's father. And uh, Martin has fulfilled his legacy. I'm still working on mine, but he, is, he has fulfilled his uh, and he has done such extraordinary work all across this country, and we're so lucky to have him. Uh, what he did with the Southern Christian Leadership Council, what he's done with realizing the dream. Martin has dedicated his life to fighting social, racial, and economic justice. That is his crusade, and he's done it extraordinarily well, and we need him and his voice more today uh, than we've needed anything in decades. So thank you. He's co-chairing our Census Council, and that's why he's here today, and I want to thank him with all he has to do for taking that on, and I'm going to introduce him in a moment. A uh, couple of points. First, these are, these are troubled times, and we were talking about it just outside. There is an anger and an ugliness that is all throughout the land. We're talking about the coronavirus and how to fight the coronavirus and the fear of the coronavirus. There's another virus that is spreading, and that is the virus of hate that is spreading all across this nation. There's a virus that is demonizing differences. That's what it is. People who are different are now bad. They're dividing us one from the other, different people of different races or different religions or different creeds. FBI says last year was the highest number of hate crimes in modern history in the United States of America. More KKK attacks, more LGBTQ attacks, more anti-Muslim activity, more anti-Semitic activity. And I'll tell you the truth, I saw it going on across the country. But I thought to myself, well, it can't happen in New York. New York, we're going to be immune from this because we know better. We lived a different life. The Statue of Liberty is in our harbor. We all are from somewhere else. We're all immigrants. They're going to demonize immigrants. We're all immigrants. Unless you're a Native American, you're an immigrant. And we know that in New York better than anyone. But I was wrong, and the virus has infected New York, and the virus is spreading in New York. This past Sunday, two days ago, I was in Albany. I went to the Jewish Community Center in Albany. There was an email bomb attack at Jewish community centers across the country. This past Hanukkah, Muncie, New York, Rockland County, stabbing in a rabbi's home, windows of a Catholic church in Yorktown Heights broken, Muslim transit worker thrown down the steps at Grand Central Station, white supremacist groups more active, more violent, more vocal all across the state. So it is time for leadership. We look to Washington, and then we look away. Because what's going on in Washington is fanning the flames. The book of Hosea says, they that sow the wind shall reap the whirlwind. And that's what we're seeing in Washington. So we do what we can. We control what we can. And in this state of New York, I'm proud to say we have the most aggressive agenda against any racial violence, uh, anti-Semitic activity, anti-African-American activity, anti-LGBTQ uh, activity, anti-discrimination in general. We're going to get it passed in this legislature. First, more police for the hate crimes unit because it is a crime. It's not just wrong and immoral. It is a crime, and we're going to prosecute it as a crime, period. I want to pass a domestic terrorism law, domestic terrorism, 
because people who are attacking people on the basis of race, color, creed are terrorists. That's who they are, and let's prosecute them for it. I want more diversity training in our public schools at younger ages so young people understand what diversity and cultural wisdom is all about. And first ever security grant program to religious institutions so you can put in the security devices you need. But I also, and we also need your help. You have to help educate people today about diversity and what it means. You have to help motivate people and get them to stand up and get them to act up and get them to understand the interconnect interconnections between all of us. That when you attack the Jewish community, you are attacking all of us. When you attack the African American community, you are attacking all of us. And I'm going to stand up for you, and I want you to stand up for me. appreciate that mutuality and act on that mutuality. When the Jewish Community Center is attacked on Sunday, I don't want to see a press release from Rabbi Ain. I want to see a press release from Reverend Johnny Green saying, I protest anti-Semitism. We have to more spontaneously motivate our people to understand you attack one of us, you attack all of us. We have to preach and educate, and you're in a better position than anyone. These acts of hate are not acts of strength. Hate is the ultimate weakness. Hate says you are afraid. Hate says you're feeling vulnerable. Hate says you are out of control of yourself. Hate is defeat. That's what hate is. You want to be strong. Strength is not the clenched fist. It's the open hand that reaches out. <laughs> the strongest four-letter word was never hate. It was always love. And that is your message in different ways and in, with different accents and through different voices. But every message comes down to that, that it is the power of love. And we need to hear that more than ever before today. We also, in this environment, have to perform a census. And the census sounds like an administrative task and it's governmental. And is it really that important? It is everything. It is everything. If you are not counted, you don't count, period. You don't count when it comes to getting federal resources, which are billions of dollars. You don't count when it comes to getting representation by an elected official in Washington. You just don't count. And we have to get this done in this environment. We have to go to people and say, we need you to register with the federal government so they know you exist. And there will be people who say, are you kidding me? You want me to register with this federal government? I'm hiding from this federal government. I'm afraid of this federal government. And you want me to register? That is going to be a response. And it's not going to be an irrational response. Reading in the newspaper every week, ICE coming in and looking here and ICE attacking this one and, and violence. That is the obstacle that we have to overcome. And we need your help to do it. We need you. We need you.
to sign people up in your organization and in your community. We're funding a whole campaign. We're spending $45 million. We have groups who can come in to your church or your temple or your mosque and help enroll people. We have people who can, we're paying to come in to your community. Or we would like to get your organizations involved in actually providing the service in your community if you want to. Because different religions, different faiths, you're all social action organizations, right? That's what we all are at the end of the day. And working with government, I believe you can perform your mission even better and fuller and more robust. To qualify for federal funding, for state funding, you have to be a 501c3 organization. That is just a legal uh, organization. Government can't contract with a religious organization. It can contract with a 501c3. I have said to many of you for a long time, you should all have a 501c3 organization. Why? Because uh, as a, a matter of community development, back in my days when I was HUD secretary, you want to build housing, you want to do community development, you look to build on rock, you look to build on strength. What is stronger in the community than the faith-based organization? What is stronger? So we've done rounds already uh, for organizations to help with this census project. We're going to do an additional round of funding in about 30 days. And we're looking for not-for-profits, 501c3s that can help us with this mission. And we're going to have a session after this for people who are not a 501c3 but would like to become or have a 501c3. We're going to help you through that process because it can be done and it can be done quickly. Uh, but you would have to make that decision to take that step. I would hope that you do, but it's up to you at the end of the day. Uh, and with that, I'll leave you with a story about the minister in the rural community, that it's up to you. Ministers living out in the outside part of a rural community, and there's been days of rain, and the county officials are afraid that there's going to be flooding, and the water's up to about now six inches, and the county officials get in this big truck, they go out, to the rural part of the county, to this minister's house. And they say to the minister, you know, there's going to be a flood. And we've been talking about it. I'm sure you heard on the radio. But we have a big truck, and we can take you and your belongings to safety. And the minister says, no, I'm a servant of our Lord. I preach his word. God will take care of me. <laughs> county officials go back and forth a little bit, but minister's not moving. County officials go back. Rain keeps coming a couple of days more. It's about six feet of water. County officials get in a boat. They go back out to see the minister in a boat. And they say, okay, we're here. We told you the rain was coming. And now, look, you got six feet of water out there. But don't worry. We have a boat. We can take you and your belongings to safety. And the minister says, no, no, no. I'm a servant of the Lord. I preach his word. The Lord will take care of me. They said, I know you said that last time. Now you got six feet of water. Your, all your stuff is floating around your house. Get in the boat. No, 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 I'm going to be fine. County officials leave. Now it keeps raining. The dam breaks. And there's a total flood. And now the minister is standing on the roof of his house. And the water is up to the minister's neck. Just his head is above the water. And he's looking up to the heavens. The minister's looking up. And he hears a giant rumbling sound. And the clouds start to part. And the minister's looking up, and there's big rumbling sound, and it's a helicopter. And the county officials are in the helicopter. <laughs> and they throw down a rope. And they say, minister, grab the rope. We'll pull you to safety. And the minister says, no, I preach the Lord's word. I'm a servant of our Lord, and our Lord will take care of this. And forget that. 
Grab the rope. You've been saying it. You, the water's coming. And the water's coming up to his chimney. He says, no, the Lord will take care of me. Next scene is at the pearly gates. <laughs> and the minister meets our Lord. And our Lord says, welcome to heaven. This is a pleasure. It's better than the alternative. And the minister looks at our Lord and says, you know, I'm confused. I was your servant. I preached your word. I thought you would take care of me. Our Lord looked back at him and said, you're confused. I'm confused. I sent a truck, a boat, a helicopter. What happened? <laughs> I think you should become a 501c3. Otherwise, don't talk to me at the pearly gates. Let's give a big New York welcome to my friend, our brother, the civil rights leader we need today, Martin Luther King III. Morning, and let me thank God for the wonderful opportunity to be back in New York. And uh, usually, Governor, people are saying they didn't want to have to follow me. But this morning, I'm saying, ooh, I, I don't know what I'm going to say. The governor was outstanding. <laughs> but thank you so much for that very warm introduction and uh, as you stated our friendship goes back for years uh, I remember when you were at Ebenezer on that Sunday morning actually I believe it was Monday morning of the King holiday and I remember that message that instilled hope and inspiration into the hearts and minds of all of those who were there, and it actually is filmed, so it was seen throughout Atlanta. And what you talked about in relationship to equality in housing and beyond is what you continue to demonstrate in this state that actually reverberates throughout our nation. So Governor, thank you so much for your leadership. It is important. Now, um, we shouldn't even have to talk about the census and being counted, particularly those of us who are in the faith tradition, because we should know that if you are not counted, you cannot be heard. But every 10 years, we have an opportunity to begin anew. And what is happening across the nation, the fear that has been instilled by Washington. We shouldn't be afraid of Washington. But there is fear that has been instilled. So it's a real challenge, and that's why it's so critical that clergy persons and spiritual leaders are so engaged this time around. Now, I certainly am honored that the governor asked me to co-chair this effort to get every vote counted in New York. And certainly we should all be working very hard to ensure that that happens. The governor is a leader at a time of division and rancor. And we are blessed to have this voice, that leadership and his actions over and over again. Now, all that said about Governor Cuomo, there's another kind of leadership that comes from our elected leaders, but also from our civic and religious, leader, religious leaders. In fact, without your leadership, 
Certainly, maybe Governor Cuomo would not even be here. That's how important you are and your congregants, those who come before you every week, millions and millions of people across our nation, listening for a word of, of inspiration and hope, but also waiting to be, receive instructions. Your voice is so important. It was the clergy that formalized strategies around the moral causes and justices and righteousness, certainly of the modern civil rights movement. My father's team became diverse. It didn't start off that way. But it became diverse. But it was the voices of those clergy persons who stood up for justice and righteousness and truth. And we made great gains. And some doors were open that will never be closed, no matter what we see happening in Washington, D.C. right now. It was the clergy persons that galvanized communities against discrimination, oppression, and disenfranchisement of those days. And I know that it is you, the clergy persons, who can make the difference today in ensuring that every citizen of this great state can be recognized, represented, and respected through the constitutionally mandated process of counting all people of our great nation. So the work is not done. Today, many of the gains we achieved and thought were forever guaranteed, they certainly are being threatened a little bit. As I said, they won't be removed totally. Gerrymandering denies a fair and just representation in our democracy. And voter suppression tactics threaten the very blood of our communities. But we will not be stopped. We will not be intimidated. We will not be deterred. There are virtues found in participating in the registering process. Actually, we call them the triple virtues of representation. They are the virtues found in participating in the registering, voting, and counting system of our democracy. Each system is essential to realizing our full potential and guaranteeing our civil rights, and more importantly, to recognizing our humanity. These three forms of political action are essential to ensuring that our rights are recognized, that our interests are represented, and that our voices are respected. In fact, the census, in many ways, is more important than the other two since it directly guarantees that your participation will have a material impact on the outcome. That impact determines the appropriation of congressional seats, which in turn determine who gets to decide what policies, institutions, procedures, and resources will be employed in our governing process and who will benefit from them. And so I must once again uh, thank each of you for being here today. I want to thank you for your leadership. But not only that, I want to challenge you to do what you do so well in difficult days like these to step away from really comfort and convenience. We could all just say, okay, we're not gonna worry about this. But these are steps we must take in times of challenge and controversy. My father used to say that the ultimate measure of a human being is not where they stand in easy or comfortable times, but in challenge and controversy. He went on to say that on some questions, Coward is asked, is a position safe? This is very critical because some may feel like it's not safe to stand up and be counted. On other positions, expediency ask, is a position politic? Well, this is all about politics, but it's far bigger than that. Vanity ask, is a position popular? Again, some may think it's not popular. But that's something deep inside that's called conscience. Ask is a position right. Sometimes he said we must take positions that are neither safe nor popular nor politic. 
But we must take those positions because our consciences tell us they're right. And our consciences have to be telling us that we've got to stand up and be counted. Everyone. <clears throat> so as co-chair of New York State Census Council, I'm on the now to challenge you and ask you to participate in a pledge. I believe we all have a copy of the pledge, hopefully. If not, maybe you can repeat these words after me. Uh, you know, um, if you got it, say something, something. Just, if, if not, just listen and, and, and please repeat these words. Because I'm not real clear. Usually I can tell what clergy persons are saying, but I'm not sure today. So do, do, do we have the pledge? No? Okay. All right. I'll just go ahead and read. In the name and the name of your in your in your name and the name of your congregation, you pledge to join the governor's statewide effort to ensure every New Yorker is counted in the 2020 decennial census. Together, it's a good idea. Why don't we stand? <laughs> that says we pledge it. Why not start that again? In your name and the name of your congregation, I pledge to join the governor's statewide effort to ensure every New Yorker is counted in the 2020 decennial census. The 2020 Together, Together we, will we will educate our congregants and extended faith community, and extended faith community about, the about the importance of the 2020 census, the 2020 census. Through, meetings, through meetings, activities, and established communication channels. We also pledge to participate in National Census Day on April 1st by issuing statements, posting on social media, and hosting events. Together, we will, we will ensure that all New Yorkers are counted. All New Yorkers are counted. Thank you, and God bless you.